All right. Okay. So let's go through the answers to the questions. What are the three core teams? Uh, many of you got this right. So that is uh, that would be origination, distribution, and structuring. Many of you have answered restructuring. I have not given marks for that. Restructuring is not the same as structuring. Okay. So uh, this is origination, <coughs> distribution, and structuring. What are their functions? Most of you said to raise capital. That's not good enough. You have to give the specific functions of each of the type, different types of teams. Okay. So origination's function is to contact potential issuers. Okay. Uh, get in touch with potential issuers and sell them on the prospects for a primary issue of either debt or equity. And then basically to fight, fight against, to compete against the other investment banks who are also uh, to try and win the lead manager position, which is the most lucrative position in terms of fees. So that is the role of origination to, to convince the potential issuer that uh, our investment bank is the best for the position to lead manage your uh, PCM issue. Okay, so that is the basic role of, uh, uh, of origination. That is what the answer should have been. Then distribution is again to convince uh, uh, for uh, upcoming uh, PCM issues. Okay, to convince the institutional investors to buy uh, those uh, to subscribe to those uh, issues. Okay, so in a PCM in a PCM issue, you would actually subscribe to the issue, and that's how you would buy it. Okay, so the, the role of Arisha, the role of distribution is to go and convince to talk to these uh, institutional investors and, and convince them to subscribe to the upcoming uh, PCM issue of either debt or equity. And then structuring, of course, as we said, is, is uh, involved in more complex transactions where the issue is not a plain vanilla issue. So structuring will get into the uh, the way the whole deal is going to be structured if it's a slightly non-standard transaction and they would interface with other divisions like tax, legal, uh, regulatory uh, as, uh, branches or the divisions of the investment bank and try to craft a, uh, you know, a customized issue. Okay. All right. So again, we have to have two marks for Kalra and Nagpal on the same team. Okay. They are involved in some discussion, which is not. So Akanksha. Your champions are performing. No, there's no doubt. <laughs> there's no doubt. <laughs> you can't have you can't have benefit of doubt when there's no doubt. In Dharam's case, there was a doubt. So because I wasn't looking at the screen at the instant they came in. Okay. All right. So let's go back to uh, the discussion. Okay. So functions. So structuring is also understood in the case of um, non-standard issues. The entire customization, the the customization of the of all the features of the uh, the issue will be uh, taken care of by uh, structuring. They will of course also have to interface with origination and distribution also to assess the preferences of issuers and investors. Okay. Because you can't customize a, a product without uh, you know basically taking into account their requirements. Three core functions in the front office of a SCM operation of an IB is sales, trading and research. Some people said trade. I've given I think one mark for that. I used said trade. Trade is not the same as somebody else also said trade. Okay, I think Tushar. So that uh, trade is not the same as trading. Okay, so sales, trading and research is what the answer should have been. Okay, and again, what are their functions? Again, not properly answered. You have to give the separate functions of each of the uh, you know desks. Okay, or the or the, uh, or the functions. So sales. Uh, we'll start with trading because trading is really what the heart of the operation is. It's the market making operation. If the trading is a market making operation, it has to make markets in at least all of the securities which the uh, uh, which the uh, PCM division has uh, le managed and committed to make markets in. Okay, so even if you're not the lead manager, you might have made a commitment to make markets. So you have the main function of the trading desk is to make markets in securities. So obviously, you have to quote two-way prices. Uh, you have to make markets in those securities where the IB has made a commitment. Uh, to make markets, okay, and in case and 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 in fact, they actually might because they are already there in that position. They have the setup. They may actually make markets in a lot of other securities where they don't has necessarily have a commitment, but they'll they'll still try and pick up market making volume, okay, and make a uh, and remember how market makers make my what is the ideal situation for market makers to make money? Volume. High volume and quiet markets. Okay, so not a lot of movement and high volume. So the market making business is heavily focused on basically vo volume generation because that is the part that you can can control uh, to some extent. You can make some efforts and generate volume with your sales desk uh, and with the support of the research desk, but you can't really do anything about the quiet markets part. Part that is just luck. If it happens, it happens. So. Um, 
the main function is of the, the, the trading desk to provide the market making for the facility okay uh, so as you see here um, as you can see in your uh, when we looked at the different firms uh, different types of yeah different types of firms uh, that exist in the financial sector and one of the types of firms we have to noted is uh, market makers okay so what is happening here if you notice actually is that that's why I said that so ma market make so investment banking is also not market making although you will find the market making function in many investment banks but you have to understand it separately as a market making function so the way this table has been designed is we are looking at core functions okay sort of at atomic level functions which we have stripped out and looked at them uh, so in fact you will find market making in the investment bank in the SCM division of the investment bank what the trading desk is doing is market making but we are not listing it as a function called investment banking okay because we are referring to investment banking mainly as the PCM activity okay and we know that it has to be supported by the SCM activity so what the trading desk is doing is actually market making and here the only difference is because uh, in SCM uh, in SCM you don't make markets in currencies and commodities okay so you make markets only in the debt and equity securities okay so that's what the trading desk is doing so this is uh, this is the part that uh, I just wanted to mention that to understand this as the SCM operation the trading desk is actually a market making function it's functioning as a market maker in debt and equity securities it is part of an investment bank but it's not what is called investment banking classically all right so uh, the third function that you have to talk uh, so the other two functions obviously is um, yeah let's discuss it we're discussing the functions of trading sales and research it's already been discussed but what do you have to say I'll just briefly cover it again so sales uh, again so trading function is understood okay so the job of sales is to drum up volume for the trading desk so sales and research actually so the in the SCM operation the heart of the operation is the trading desk because that represents the market making commitment of the investment bank and so the sales and trading exists to basically uh, support the trading desk and generate enough volume okay and so uh, the sales jo job of the salesman is basically you'll have institutional in institutional debt sales and institutional equity sales these are the kind of designations that you will find and these guys go and talk to institutional investors in equities and debt and they try to generate basically try and you know create a uh, buzz around some stocks which the trader wants to trade and then uh, make those guys incentivize those guys to trade with their trading desk okay that's the job of sales and um, sometimes these guys are also called sales traders okay sales trading is also a designation you'll hear but sales traders actually uh, kind of uh, they would exist more in uh, your uh, in, in currencies and commodities okay that designation is more seen in currencies and commodities we'll just look at the the uh, sales trading and research distinction in the SCM operation as we have discussed it okay so sales and research also has to support the trading desk so when the when the sales guy is actually going to the institutional investor and trying to convince him to trade in stocks of certain companies okay then uh, the, the investor how does he form a view because if he has to trade he's gonna either buy or sell right so in order to fi either buy or sell you need to have a view on the stock first okay so how do you form the view you form it through research obviously either you do your own research as an institutional investor or you rely on the research provided uh, sometimes a combination of both you rely on the research provided by the IB okay so that's where the role of research comes in so the re role of research on the front in the front office is to, pro to create uh, research reports on uh, you know on particular securities which will help institutional investors to take a decision as to wh whether to buy or to sell is this clear that's the role of research okay and something else that because some of you may be interested in research roles something else that you have to understand in terms of a developing scenario in international markets now now historically what has happened is uh, and research if you see here I have uh, given the research as a advisory function okay here I've listed research as advisory function okay and I've listed it as independent research so when you see the research division within a central uh, within a SCM operation okay the ideal way to think about it in this kind of a framework where we are looking at atomic level functions you think of it as if it's an independent research function which has been put into that SCM slot are you following so that's why because research is a separate function research is an advisory function 
okay unlike trading trading is not an advisory function it's a execution that you have to do so it's not an advisory function the research is an advisory function so the way to think about the scm operation is that you have uh, the sales trading and research on the front office okay so the trading is actually a market making function here okay the trading is market making then the research is actually an advisory function so when we think of the pure the reason this is listed like this that you could actually have firms which are pure market makers which are not part of an investment bank you could have firms which are pure market making firms okay you do have some firms like that and you could also have firms which are pure research firms they only provide research are you following why i've made this framework this way that everything has been stripped down to an atomic level uh, you know uh, entity so research is of advisory function okay and you do have many firms in the sector in the financial sector which provide only research they don't have any other operation they are just selling their research okay so that's that's why uh, so when you see the and similarly you have market making firms who have no investment banking operations all they do is make markets they just exist as a market that's their only function so that's why the way to see it is that when you're looking at the sales trading and research inside a investment bank okay uh, this is all in one box if you see sales trading and research in, inside the investment bank the right way to see it is that as if you had an independent market making operation in those securities inserted into the front office and that's the trading desk are you following what i'm saying i hope people are not getting confused okay let's try and um, use the pen uh, to understand this maybe but when we are not capturing it on um, so if we say here see this is say sales sales is separate okay trading and research so this sales trading and research that you're looking at we'll just collapse this what happened where is it where did i write that sales trading oh here 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 okay yeah so what i'm saying is that sales trading and research here that you see okay this is part of the front office of an investment bank okay so what i'm saying is the way you have to think about it is actually uh, of a front office in the scm operation okay the way you have to think of it ideally is that it's as if you had the trading division uh, the trading desk is like functioning like uh, any other independent market maker in securities okay it's just that it happens to be part of the scm operation are you following the function that the reason it is listed like this the function that it is performing is no different from an independent market maker okay you have some many firm you have many firms who are independent market makers okay so uh, these so so the trading desk is functioning like any other independent market maker so when you see the trading desk inside the uh, on the front office of the scm operation you think of it as an independent market making desk which has been kind of just inserted into the uh, ib framework are you following not following it's very difficult maybe i'm not explaining it well but anyway maybe i'm over complicating it also it's it's just like i don't know how to explain it but the point is that uh, you have uh, what the trader what the trading desk inside an uh, scm operation is doing is no different from what an independent market maker would be doing there are some firms in the fex sector whose job is only to make markets they are not part of any investment bank or anything they are just a pure market making business okay so these guys what they are doing the independent market makers and what the trading desk inside an investment bank is doing is qualitatively the same uh, identical function it is just that the trading desk happens to be located inside the front office of an scm operation that's all there is to it is this clear okay now that's all there is to it so don't over uh, i mean don't complicate it further you can just uh, you know think about it a little bit similarly there exist in the industry there in the financial sector there exist many firms who are pure research providers okay like in india you might have seen this there's a firm called value research which provides uh, research on mutual funds okay so what is that guy doing he's he doesn't have any other operation he's just producing research and selling research okay that's a pure research firm you have many such firms all around the world okay that their, their role is they are just pure research firms that's why i've listed them and their function is actually not market making or anything like that their function is an advisory function okay under advisory we have many types of activities one of which is mna okay so one of the advisory one of the functions under advisory 
uh, under the category of advisors these are people who are we have called them advisors so one of the types of advisors you see is research firms okay so the pure research firm again what i'm trying to say is that when you see sales trading research inside the okay when you see sales trading research as part of the uh, scm operation of an investment bank the research desk okay the research desk uh, in that operation is no different qualitatively than what uh, an independent research firm is is uh, is basically it's the same they are doing the same function they're performing the same function they are both producing either fa or ta type of research on uh, various securities is this clear is this clear now yes. you're following okay the only difference is that these guys when you risk them as advisors and independent research firms because they, i mean if, here at this stage they could also be producing research on uh, commodities and currencies which an scm operation will not produce because an scm operation uh, operation will only produce equities and debt research because capital markets is considered concerned only with equities and debt is this clear but functionally the idea is the same is to generate fa and ta analysis which will help people to take decisions as to whether to buy or to sell the stock clear i don't know some of the many other faces in the first period but many other faces seem to be like kind of uh, lost what happened are you following or not okay everybody is like half dead at 9 30 in the morning okay what happened coffee you need coffee i have i have always advocated for free coffee for the students you know so that you know outside the class there should be coffee okay all right so let's uh, so this covers the answer long answer but this is how the answer should have been given okay so sales trading and research i just want to mention a few things about research uh the few things about research what is happening is see historically what has happened is the research function has not been separately priced okay so if you go back to this framework we had um, okay so we have sales trading and research inside the scm operation front office okay now what happens to the research is that the research how does the uh, you see why sales and trading uh, sales and research support trading okay what the research how do these guys they have to pay the research analysts equity analysts are quite well paid okay but how is the firm making money out of their research what historically they have done and which continues to the be the practice outside the eu okay uh, eu is european union okay so uh, what continues to be the practice historically ha has also been hist historically the practice is that the research has always been given free so let's say say credit suisse is producing some equity research so they would give equity their, all the equity research produced by their uh, research team they would give it for free to all their institutional clients all the institutional clients that the sales team is going to go and pitch to okay so the sales team will go and meet the institutional clients and say okay now i, I will put you on the mailing list for our research output okay so they will get the research from these guys the institutional investors who these guys are targeting okay they will get the research for free and the way the bank gets compensated is that in return what the sales guy will say is that if you want to do some trading please do some trading with us okay so that's where what basically how the bank gets compensated is that they get trading volume so the relation the equation is not 100 percent clear cut you give research for free and then sometimes you'll get some trading volume in return okay this is the way it has worked even outside the scm uh, uh, operation okay scm is only concerned with capital markets so when you go into these kinds of uh, advisors when they exist in let's say the treasury division of a commercial bank let's say when the treasury division like i've given you that technical analysis bulletin remember i've given you for the last the technical analysis bulletin which i used to write for standard charter yes i've given you that uh, those historical bulletins okay so this bulletin again was that is what that is technical research that is technical research being produced by the treasury uh, and i was functioning as a re part of the research team right so that used to be given free to the clients of standard charter and how would we get compensated the way we would get compensated is that when they wanted to trade in foreign exchange they would call our trading desk is this clear that is again what is happening that is also a market making function 
except that it's not an SCM operation because it's trading in foreign exchange. So that report used to be mainly focused on foreign exchange. Okay, so uh, so that uh, that was a market making function. So when you see a foreign exchange trading desk inside a commercial bank like Standard Chartered, okay, if you see a, com a foreign exchange trading desk, that's also nothing but a market making function. Okay, except that we wouldn't call it a SCM operation because foreign exchange is not part of the capital markets. Okay, so it's not trading in equities and debt. It's trading in foreign exchange or commodities, etc. Okay, so that's uh, that's again a market making operation. Are you following the same setup even in other market making operations? Uh, the research function used to function has historically functioned has been historically said given out for free. The research output has been given out for free. So whether it's in the foreign ex on the foreign exchange trading desk of a commercial bank okay which is engaging again in market making so you have to understand that the core function is market making when you see the foreign exchange trading desk in a commercial bank and when you see the equity trading desk inside an investment bank okay they are qualitatively the same they are both market making operations that's what i'm trying to emphasize here is this clear now the point they're both the function that they're performing is both market making except that one guy happens to be doing it in equities and one guy happens to be doing it in foreign exchange but you should understand conceptually that the function is the same it's a market making function okay you are just operating in different asset classes and different markets and making markets by quoting two-way prices all right and customers will keep calling you so even in the if you look at since we just started the discussion about the foreign exchange trading desk of a commercial bank because foreign exchange is such a big market you should have some idea about it okay so again you'll see the same kind of setup when you go to the this we described as part of the scm operation of an investment bank again you'll see the same kind of setup here okay as you see here again here on the foreign exchange trading desk of a, of a commercial bank of a large commercial bank you'll see sales trading and research so the trading guys will be making markets in currencies okay and then the sales guys you'll have there are many designations like foreign exchange sales sometimes you have specialized designation like fx option sales okay so that means that guy's job that salesman's job is to purely just sell fx options and he's going to support the fx option trading desk okay so if it's just plain fx sales he will support the fx spot trading desk remember when we looked at our framework what does our framework say So there are many types of instruments. Now again, we are re rehashing the framework that in any when you are looking at markets within any asset class. In this case, we are discussing currencies. Okay, so you could have spot markets. Okay, which is where most of the volume is. But you could also have option markets in currencies. All right. So that's why you will see where sometimes you will see designations like FX option sales. So this guy is head of FX option sales. You might actually have a big team of uh, like in city singapore they had a big team uh, of uh, people just focusing on fx option sales okay and then you could further subdivide that de depending on the volume of the op uh, the size of the operation you can further subdivide that into you know private bank and uh, you know the the institutional customers so mainly here we are discussing institutional customers so again so you will have the same setup in the foreign, uh, in the market making operation for foreign exchange in, in a commercial bank treasury so they'll have sales trading resource trading guys will make markets in foreign currencies okay uh, like you've seen on the wanda platform those bid offer prices they are posting that's all being posted mainly by commercial banks okay and then the sales of uh, sales teams will go and talk to various in investors corporate corporate clients institutional clients all those guys who need to trade in foreign exchange okay so many people need to trade in foreign exchange because all this international trade is going on investors are investing across borders okay many many us funds invest outside the us so they all have foreign exchange requirements so these are the kinds of people that the sales team is going to contact and once again they're going to give out the research for free so then you'll have that research team on the uh, on the foreign exchange desk you'll have the research team whose job is to produce research on foreign exchange okay so it'll be ta and fa research on foreign exchange and this research will be given for free to the institutional investors by the sales desk and the sales desk will say okay guys please do some trading with us okay in return i'm giving you this research for free and return please do some trading with us okay so they will be saying this to the corporate desk as well as the uh, institutional uh, to the cooperative customers as well as the institutional customers so are you getting the framework now how a typical market making operation works okay it is supported by sales and research okay and this is where and and so you see one manifestation of that in the scm division of an ib in the front office 
Okay, so now the part I wanted to emphasize about research to argue because you need to understand what is happening, how the trends are shifting in the industry. So there's been a new um, there's been a new regulation in the in the EU called uh, what is that regulation called? I mentioned it briefly. Do you remember it? In the last class, I mentioned it briefly. Does anyone remember? There is a regulation in the European Union called uh, MIFID 2 okay so there was MIFID 1 also and uh, you can just google and uh, check out what MIFID stands for MIFID stands for actually markets in financial instruments directive okay so it's a regulatory uh, measure from the EU okay so here you can see once again uh, why I you can see here the affirmation or, or the sort of vindication of this framework why this framework why I have not taught you asset classes are equities debt futures and options why futures and options are not asset classes they're actually instruments okay so you can see it in the EU regulation which is MIFID 2 MIFID stands for markets in financial instruments directive okay so you see that these markets what did I say that there are there are asset classes okay in the asset class in any given asset class you will have you can have many types of mark many markets okay and each market will be in uh, some instrument can be in some instrument or the other okay so you can have FX spot markets you can have FX forward markets, you can have FX swap markets and you can have FX option markets. Okay. And uh, al also futures as well. Okay. So that's the point. So that's what that's where you see the markets are in financial instruments. Are you following? That's why in your textbook in the first IPM textbook, you have a taxonomy which says asset classes are equities, debt, futures and options. That's wrong. Okay. Futures and options are not asset classes. They are instruments. Okay. So this is the right classification. You can see this been vindicated by the EU uh, directive, the markets in financial instruments. Now, one of the things that MIFID 2 does, it comes up with a lot of regulations. One of the things that MIFID 2 is saying is that this business, we don't like this business of giving the research for free. We think it's kind of shady. The European regulators are saying that we think that business of giving the research for free is kind of shady. Okay don't do that sometimes there's also another practice that many of these uh, SCM operations had they used to provide uh, you know they, they used to provide like uh, infrastructure to the institutional investors so there's like you might have a uh, say let's say uh, share Khan as a brokerage okay uh, might want to or uh, which also runs let's say a trading uh, desk a market making operation they might actually give some computers free to HDFC mutual fund and they might give some software for free to HDFC mutual fund saying that okay guys please trade with us in return for all this okay so many of these uh, what the European regulators are saying is that this practice is kind of shady and it creates a conflict of interest because what the Europeans so understand all these dynamics because uh, nothing in real life happens in a silo okay it is all the finance and the legal aspects everything is all connected okay so what the European regulators are saying is so you should be able to bring in whatever you've learned in, in law to the picture that what the European regulators are now saying is that this is represents a conflict of interest because these institutional customers that these guys are targeting okay so these guys are targeting all the uh, their customers okay so the customers are mainly let's say F we'll just use this short word FII here we call them FII so I'm just going to call them II now I'm just going to call them II okay for institutional investors but I don't want to say this big word every time so these guys the sales desk is contacting IIs but these IIs are who these are actually pension funds these are pension funds institutional investors are pension funds and uh, mutual funds okay now these guys what the regulators are saying is that these guys have a fiduciary responsibility you understand what is a fiduciary responsibility it is like you have a responsibility to look out for uh, you know take care of the interest of someone else okay it's like a trustee you heard of a trust fund yes, okay so a trustee is basically not the uh, you know the uh, beneficial owner okay of the not the equitable owner of the assets he's the you know owner in name but he has to run the trust fund for the benefit of the beneficiary okay so here then basically that's what is the idea behind a fiduciary responsibility so similarly when HDFC mutual fund is taken money from various investors okay then let's say the California state employee state teachers pension fund is running pension fund money they are running that money on behalf of the teachers who are going to one day retire okay it is not their own money so in all these cases there is a fiduciary responsibility and what the regulators are saying is that is that if the institutional investors get the research for free if they get the research for free then it creates a conflict of interest because then they might go and trade with credit suisse even if credit suisse is not giving the best price 
so the idea is that they have extended the idea of the fiduciary responsibility what that means is that the institution the ii's also have to get the best price for every trade are you following because they are not managing their own money they are managing money for teachers who are going to retire one day they are managing money for investors who put in money into the mutual funds okay so they have to ensure they have a responsibility to ensure that they get the best price for every trade and what they are saying is that if they have been getting free research from credit suisse then if credit suisse is still not even if credit suisse is not providing the best price they may still have to go and trade with credit suisse just to honor the obligation that they have incurred an obligation by getting research for free are you following the argument this is a very interesting argument and it's important for you to be aware of this as well so it's not just finance there is also legal aspects which come into how the world actually operates because this has real implications uh, in how businesses actually run regulation has real implications on on how businesses run so have you followed the logic i've given are you following the logic that because institutional iis are managing money for other people they have what is called a fiduciary responsibility okay that means uh, inter alia that means that you have to get the best price for every deal but if you are getting free research from some people you might trade with them just to honor their obligation and even if it's not the best price are you following now is this clear so that's why the re eu mifid 2 says no more free research okay now this has serious implications for people considering careers in research and who knows what will happen whether e mifid 2 will apply largely only in europe or it might be extended to other parts of the world but what research analysts who people who want to be in research should be ready for is that you have to be now you're going to become much more accountable now what's happening is now banks are being forced to charge for their research so mifid 2 says you have to charge for your research so every bank is now saying that you know our uh, if you want to talk to our analyst okay if you want to talk to our oil and gas analyst it will cost you like $4000 an hour or $5000 an hour or something like that okay and so many of the institutional investors are saying your guys are not worth that much so so there is a serious uh, sort of uh, amount of turmoil in the research business because now the banks are being forced to charge for research so the now the question becomes what is the fair price of this research what is the real how much is the market really willing to pay for this research if they have to pay for it so that is one big question that has come up so for people who want to become research analysts one of the jobs that one of the things you have to be aware of is that you better make your research very very effective so that people um, what happened you want to switch off the ac yes sir why 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 <laughs> it's cold yes. get a shawl no <laughs> shalimar bag is nearby go get a shawl <laughs> don't don't so it will become very hot there now it's already uh, now it's already winter now you should be getting your winter wear <laughs> it will become crazy if we switch off the ac it will become too warm okay guys so i wanted to mention this uh, important point about those who feel cold please get shawls okay from uh, in in the future what happened okay have you understood this point that i made about mifid 2 about what is happening in the, how the research business is changing how so you need to understand both you need to understand how historically research has been uh priced which is basically it's not not been explicitly priced this is what we call a bundle service it you, you heard these terms bundled and unbundled okay so now what mifid 2 <clears throat> what mifid 2 is forcing uh, people to do okay all market making operations are now being forced to which includes the scm operations okay all market making operations uh, which were supported by sales and trading uh, sales and research desks are now being forced to unbundle this is how we would use the word now they are being forced to unbundle the research and sell it separately okay now which is putting tremendous amount of pressure on research analysts because now the market is really going to price what they are actually worth okay they're going to really put a price on their research so this is something you have to be aware of as a developing uh, a phenomenon okay so mifid 2 has come into force from january of 2018 okay so you should be aware of all these things okay so let's go back to uh, so that completes the discussion on our uh, it's a long discussion but i wanted to add these elements to your uh, discussion of uh, the market making operations inside a uh, scm unit so we'll continue with our discussions with um, with going down the
So I was telling you about the uh, research output on Zero Hedge. Yesterday there was an article for about uh, Goldman Sachs doing some research on the big term structure that was on Zero Hedge. So you can dig that up and get a feel for how research is produced. If you want to look at other equity research reports, I'll just give you, I don't know if they still have it for free. Um, all right. Okay, so research. Um, so what we have discussed as a topic, I'm just giving you the, since you have the video, I'm not giving detailed writing uh, write up on that. But what the topic that we have discussed just now, <coughs> that we have finished discussing, uh, discussing, is the traditional pricing of research and the new developments due to MFIT2. Is this clear? Okay, uh, I'll just give you one more point here, just here. It should be in that other point, but uh, um, you can actually look up this Zach's if you're interested in how equity research reports are, uh, are produced, look on Zero Hedge, you might find some of those reports. Uh, unlikely, but then you can also look for Zacks. Zacks used to give, Zacks produces some equity research reports and they used to give them out for free earlier. Now I don't know whether they're still free or not, but you can just check um, Zacks equity research reports. I'll just give you, so if you want to get an idea of how it is written, okay. All right. Okay. So middle office, we have all discussed all of this stuff. Now we can go on to, we go back to our framework and see what we want to study now. Agency brokers. I think where we ended the other day was basically agency brokers, <coughs> right? This is where we were. This is a little co bit confusing because I put in sales trading. I'm going to just widen this once more. All right. Okay. So agency brokers, everyone is clear about agency brokerage. Okay, the reason we call them agency brokers is that they're not acting as a principal. Okay, they are pure brokerage firms. Okay, that's why if you see here, what have I listed here? This I've listed as a standalone category. So one of the types of players you have in financial markets is this category of agency brokers. Okay, they, all they do is brokerage. So, um, all right, so then we can go on to the next category. Okay, exchanges and clearing houses, this we have already discussed extensively. So you know what their function is. Their function is essentially to manage, uh, sorry, to host and clear exchange traded markets. Is this clear? Exchange traded markets, you already understand now. So the, the also we have to again see these people as separate types of entities. So what this framework does is it basically lists out all the separate types of pure functions that are being uh, performed in the finance sector by different types of firms, okay? So exchanges, I'm not spending money. We were supposed to go into uh, traditional and alternative asset management, okay? That is the discussion that we were supposed to had, have. Um, I need to just, let me just. Uh, traditional, this is. And there was a table also. I will put this table uh, into your uh, folder so you will not need to note this down but let's just understand this is a very important distinction also to be clear about all these uh, uh, concepts and how to how to analyze different types of players okay okay so uh, it's important to understand the difference between the am is normally referred to I'm just going to say tam and am from now on because they're shorter okay so uh, am is also loosely referred to as hedge funds but the proper terminology would be am so but obviously because that when you say it, the full word is quite the full expression is long so people just say hedge funds for short but you should be clear that this is actually the proper term am okay um, now here traditional you can read most of the stuff let's take the first point okay if you remember some of you had come during your summer training uh, to discuss about some some problems and at that time i'd mentioned to you about uh, whether the fund that they wanted you to manage is a long only fund 
if you remember we had that discussion some of you there tandvi was there double a was there maybe sina was also there okay so we had that discussion in the in 201 okay so uh, so one of the things that happens is one of the ways to understand whether a fund is a part of the tam universe or the am universe is that historically you've had most of it is, that's why it's called tam traditional historically the dominant type of firm has been a firm which only trades from the long side okay so typically the mandate remember this uh, investor mandate that we discussed while discussing decision problems so historically what has happened is that the investment management business has been uh, now we have to deduct marks for giri also he is deep in conversation with somebody the giri is communicating sending out signals <laughs> Giri, Giri is also somebody like Ayush has to be made to sit on the. You also should be made to sit on the front bench so that you don't lose marks for your team. You are losing marks for your own team. Minus sixteen. You are giving. Giri के लिए minus one का. Tum, why? Rule vote तो ना मतलब बहुत. So you are giving tough competition to Tanvi's team. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Now, first distinction to understand: <coughs> historically, investment management firms have been long only, which means that they are not allowed to go short. You understand the difference between? You understand what is meant by net short? So, if I buy a thousand shares of Apple, so okay, yeah, the net position would be short. So, if I buy a thousand shares of Apple and then I sell six hundred shares of Apple, my net position is still long four hundred. Okay. But if I start out by going short Apple, okay, then my first position is a short trade. Then I'm short, let's say, a thousand shares. That's going a. That means my net position is short. I have a net short position. So that is not allowed in traditional investment management mandates. Okay, uh, most of the time the in, the mandate included this long only rule that you can only buy and sell uh, equity and debt secure. Uh, sorry, you can only buy initially. You can only you have to maintain a net long position. The point is that you have to maintain a net long position in equities and debt. That is the mandate that was given. That's why it's called long only. So these types of firms, the, you need to be aware of the jargon also. These types of firm, funds are called long only funds. Okay, that means you are only allowed to hold net long positions. No net short position is not allowed. Okay, so the difference in uh, AM versus TAM is in AM you can go both ways. Okay, you've heard of many short uh, funds. Like there are many short. Uh, one of the terms that you will hear is what is called long short equity. Okay, so this I'll just put this term here. One typical type of firm is if you see if you see your mandate. Uh, essentially, in the NSC project, the mandate that was given to you, okay, uh, is so this is long only. We already got it there, but I'm just writing it here again. All right. So, if you look at, look at your NSC fund, the NSC fund that you were managing, that was what, long short or long only? Long short. Long short, right? So there was no restriction given to you. The mandate included the uh, ability to go net short. Okay, if you could find the shares to borrow. Okay, uh, so that's why. So this is the distinction that we make. The terminology you need to be particular about the terms that you use. So in the TAM universe, these would be called long only funds. And in the uh, AM universe, these are called long short funds. So one very common type of terminology, the term that you might see, is we say that I'm running a U.S. equities uh, long short fund, long short U.S. equity. One name of a fund, typical name of a fund would be long short U.S. equities. Okay, which means I'm operating in the, which tells you that I'm operating only in U.S. equities. I'm not trading Japanese shares or German shares. Okay. And it also tells you that this is an AM type of fund because it is a long short fund. Is this clear? Okay. Most people are they seem to be all lost in their own universe. Many of you are not uh, engaged in the class. Okay. Uh, this and again, invested as uh, typically in the AM universe. Now, I, maybe I don't need to. Is it boring if I just go through this, or what? What should I just skip over this and let let it let it let you guys read it on your own? Okay, so you know, because everybody seems to be quite switched off. I don't know what the problem is. Everyone seems to be quite switched off. They are all lost in their old universe. It's, you know, it's like it's like you know, you are sitting in a class where somebody is talking in Norwegian or something or some language which you don't understand. So, okay, so TAM essentially again we had the historical uh, trend has been. 
that we have invested that's why you see we have invested only in equities and debt that's why if you see uh, if you look at your traditional finance textbooks okay and if you look at your traditional MBA in most of the MBA even today if you look at most business schools you can ask your friends who are in other business schools they would be doing these courses called SAPM okay which is securities analysis and portfolio management okay and even in the IPM if they have in the IPM most of these courses would focus only on equity and debt securities okay but because there are two other major asset classes like currencies and commodities which don't get covered okay that's why i teach finance from the comprehensive perspective and that's the way you should look at it that you can operate in any asset class so tam actually is like a special case of so in most cases if you see most business schools the course on ipm or sapm will focus on equities and debt if you look at the textbooks also if you look at your own textbook of that body cane markers it will typically have an equities and debt focus okay because that is coming from this historical trend of uh, the tam universe okay what the historical practice of managing investments only in equities and debt and that's why those textbooks have that kind of uh, narrow focus but i feel it is more appropriate to study it from the broadest possible uh, perspective and then you see tam is actually like a special case of am you heard you remember the expression special case from mathematics that a particular function is a special case of some other function yes. so if i have a function which can take both positive and negative values okay and then i put a constraint on that function saying that uh, then i uh, come up with a variant of that function which can only take positive values so this function which can only take positive values becomes a special case of the more general function which can take both positive and negative values you remember this kind of discussion from maths yes. some of you do right okay so this is basically what the one other way to look at this is actually although we call this traditional asset management or this is the mainstream approach this is still the mainstream approach tam is still the mainstream approach okay most of the funds are still managed under tam but actually if you see it logically tam is actually a special case of am can you see that you should start to look at it from that point of view TAM is a special case of AM because in TAM in AM you can go long short and in AM you can go only long. So this is the same as like a function takes both positive, positive negative values but in the variant you put in a constraint that this can take only positive values so that's a special case of that function okay. So are you following this so you can actually think of TAM as a special case of AM because in AM you have a lot more flexibility and in AM you find that generally the flexibility is much less. On, on many fronts okay so one front we can see where there is limited flexibility is on this business of going long and short you can't go both long and short you can only go long net long okay second is asset classes that you can invest in okay only as we see here in TAM we can only go into these two right we can only operate in these two asset classes equities and debt in TAM but in AM we are free to operate in any asset class that we want is this clear and even real estate funds you might see many even indian firms like edelweiss says some some time back they closed a real estate investment fund so that would also fall under am okay so that fund is now focused that fund is focused purely on real estate the job is to just basically go and make investments in various real estate projects okay so that's an am fund because it doesn't fall under the tam umbrella because it is outside the realm of equities and debt is this clear so tam again and again you'll see that tam is a special case of am all right okay and am obviously you can invest in any asset class okay so okay investable instruments type typically cash and spot only okay so this is what you have again in am in, in tam you are confined so you can see how uh, the basic nature of am relative to tam is all kinds of restrictions which don't exist in AM. Okay. Now here again, when you go into TAM, you are being confined to cash and spot markets. Okay. You are not typically allowed the typical uh, mutual fund, the typical TAM uh, vehicle will not have the right to invest in derivative products. Okay. Which means what are your derivative products? You see that if you leave out cash and spot on the other side, you have the orange line. These are your derivative products. Can you see that this orange line here? this orange line derivative products this covers all this stuff right yeah okay so therefore in in uh, the one of the characteristics of tam funds is that they are not allowed to invest in derivative products so they are confined to these cash and spot markets okay so all kinds of restrictions these are all the various aspects 
on which you have restrictions here in in am you can do anything options swaps futures whatever you want to do okay typically unless you put some own you put some of your own constraint there are many funds which are highly specialized they are only options funds and then they only sell options okay so you could have some funds which are very specialized okay so these will be am funds but these are restrictions that they have chosen to put on themselves okay the fund has chosen to put these restrictions on themselves because they want to target a particular type of customer okay but in general in am funds everything is allowed okay it's a very uh, there's a lot of flexibility okay now another point on which there is a restriction in tam leverage you remember what leverage is okay. leverage is not debt okay let's have this discussion so okay fine yeah yeah okay so yeah so yeah okay fine so you can say use of debt in that sense so because i have not asked you the question in a sufficiently specific manner okay um, what is the let's say how would you calculate leverage if i rephrase the question your answers are correct in the general way that i asked the question your answers are okay use of use of debt debt etc but now if i say how would you calculate leverage you have set up some leverage for your oanda accounts 100 100 is to 1 you've set up oanda accounts we had this discussion in the class remember yes. now if i rephrase the question and make it more specific how would you calculate leverage what is your answer the answer is not good enough answer is not good enough question is clear how would i calculate leverage if wanda is giving me 100 is to 1 leverage what exactly does that mean we have discussed this in the class we have actually discussed this in the class when we were doing our classes in the finance lab i remember doing discussing this in the class let's do it one more time guys one see we can buy 800 dollars we have buy 100 dollars yeah yeah you can buy but it needs to be more specific this is what dipankshu mentioned the other day when we were discussing this okay when i discussed leverage when we had this earlier discussion which all of you or most of you have forgotten so let get this clear leverage equals total position value divided by account equity okay let me just i will put this into your notes one by one but let's let's uh, i'll put this into your notes but let's first just discuss and understand this this recap quickly guys most of you have forgotten i don't know why your retention is so poor okay so when i ask you how would you calculate leverage this is a mathematical answer leverage equals total position value divided by account equity okay clear and then the course there's the question is what is your uh, what is your um, total position value then the question might arise what is tpv it is number of shares into price number of uh, shares i guess it's the number of shares into price of no but again you're ans not answering in a general enough way so not shares we can say the number of securities no that is also not general you should say assets assets because all assets are not securities but all securities are assets okay so your answer should always be given in a as general of uh, you know framework as possible as, as general uh, sort of frame of reference as possible so the answer is so so the total position value is price simple price per unit into number of units okay number of units bought or sold is this clear so this is a mathematical answer okay if i ask you how would you calculate leverage leverage equals total tpv by a okay and ae you understand ae is the amount of money that you have actually put into your account okay your equity yeah your net worth as it be calculated the equity and uh, after you have started trading you have some unrealized losses etc then your net worth will obviously go down so therefore leverage equals tpv by account equity and tpv equals number of units into unit price okay so all right So is this clear now? This is what leverage is. Okay, this is how you calculate leverage. Your general answer is okay for the first question, which I had not framed in a sufficiently specific manner. So once again, in TAM, no leverage is allowed. In typical mutual funds, they are not. If they have a thousand crores of assets, okay, a thousand crores of investable funds, the maximum amount of securities they can buy is thousand crores. 
at that point okay and then those securities might appreciate in value and then they may sell some of them get some realized profits etc they can invest more with that okay but the point is they cannot use leverage so there essentially what will happen is there what will if we go back to this formula what will what does mean what does this mean leverage has to be confined to leverage cannot be more than one so tpv has to be always equal to account equity is this clear because leverage cannot be more than one okay Le no leverage is allowed okay what that means essentially is again no leverage is allowed is the english language way of stating it mathematically the way you would state it is that leverage must be less than one okay that is the way to state it mathematically okay is this clear guys okay no leverage is used i must have given them a uh, link to some to leverage okay so and in uh, in hedge funds in in am okay all kinds of widespread leverage is allowed okay depends on how much leverage your uh, counterparty is going to allow you how market makers if you trading with a particular market maker who is maintaining your account okay like oanda is an example of a market maker so oanda is allowing you 100 to 1 now is giving you lots of options okay and you'll notice in some functions like i think the tanush went and opened an account with wanda canada and his leverage was being restricted to 50s to 1 yes, sir. okay yes, sir. yeah 50s to 1 so actually then we need to find out those this now why is this happening remember I, I answered this when giri was asking this question so this is how otc markets get regulated because the canadian regulators must have put in a rule uh, that saying that Oanda, because Oanda Canada has to be incorporated in Canada, it needs an operating license in Canada, so it has to follow the Canadian regulations. So in the Canadian regulations, they must have put in this rule that okay, we'll let you operate here, but you cannot allow anyone opening an account with Oanda Canada to have leverage of more than 50s to 1. That's why there you see 50s to 1. Some other jurisdictions would give you maybe 100 is to 1. Okay, So it all depends on this is how regulation is done in the case of OTC markets. Okay, Individual, you have to operate somewhere. So you operate um, in right. Now again, next point, benchmarks for performance evaluation. This is very important. You already seen one case in your, one of your projects where you have done, um, where you had an example of uh, performance evaluation. What is the benchmark that we used in your IPM project? No. What? How did you guys get ranked? Sir, maximum drop down. Yeah. Maximum drop down. <laughs> what is the actual metric that we used? Any about maximum not NAV percentage return okay so the metric that we used was percentage return over the period divided by the maximum drawdown over the period okay so what we use the measure that we use was total profit to maximum draw I mean, uh, percentage profit percentage profit to uh, ratio of percentage profit to maximum drawdown now you remember all that how drawdown was calculated yes sir Right now, many of you have now. If I ask people about what is drawdown, almost you will not remember. Sir, peak to trough. Yeah, maximum peak to trough, uh, you know, drop in equity value. Okay, so in any given chart, you can see if you think that dollar, dollar Swiss is, let's say, forget about this being dollar Swiss, let's say this is a chart of your account equity, this is a plot of your account equity. Okay, so this is what cross sectional data or time series data. Time series data. Okay, so this is a plot of your account equity. So drawdown here means maximum. Let's say you started from here. Okay, so here obviously the maximum drawdown is going to be from here to here. Okay, so there's no other place where there's maximum draw of this, this magnitude. But these are also drawdowns from here to here. This is also a drawdown because you made this much profit, then you lost this much. This is all drawdown. So these are also drawdown. This is also a drawdown. Okay. But then you take the maximum drawdown, you take the maximum uh, percentage loss uh, uh, in account equity from the previous equity peak. This is clear, that's maximum drawdown. So the metric that we used to evaluate your project, okay, was because it was an AM project, because it was an AM project, we used an, a metric that would be typically used in the AM universe, okay, which is percentage profit divided by maximum drawdown, okay. 
remember that this is a this is an this is the measure of risk adjusted return or absolute return risk adjusted return okay so and what is representing the risk here yeah that maximum drawdown number is meant to proxy your risk that this is how risky your trading style is that uh, you have lost so much money eventually you have made more money than when you, you started with okay a little bit more money that you started with but you have lost so much money so this shows you that this your fund is quite risky the way you're managing your fund it's quite risky so this is a measure of risk so therefore there's a risk adjusted in both in in both tam and am you will use measures of risk adjusted return okay but the measures tend to be different so one of the measures you might use in am okay that's why i gave you an am measure is this kind of measure percentage profit to maximum drawdown okay it's a very simple measure and it gives you a, perce a perception of so if you made let's say you made a 45 percent profit okay and but you had a maximum drawdown of 15 percent so your ratio would be three okay your ratio would be three so this is how you get the and so somebody else who has made a profit of 90 percent with drawdown of maybe just uh, you know uh, three percent his ratio will be 30 so he's deemed to be a much better fund manager than you because he has a ratio of 30 of uh, profit to maximum drawdown okay so another ratio so this is one example of a ratio that might be used now we are talking about performance evaluation okay we're talking about performance evaluation so uh, another ratio that might be uh, so this is one example of a ratio that would be used this is used at the am universe drawdown would typically not be used with the tam universe okay time okay great excellent set your alarms okay next time we we'll set the alarm anybody has any technical question then i will not close the